Good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tamar Friedman and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, and I want to welcome you today to an important conversation on introducing the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund. I know a lot has been going around about it. A lot has, there might be some questions about it. So we are very uh, fortunate to have three people with us today that can, that can explain it and answer all of your questions. And with that, um, I want to also tell everybody that we will have lots of time towards the end for questions and answers. Feel free throughout to type in your questions in the chat box to everybody or to me personally, and we will try to get through everything by um, in our hour here together. And with that, I want to introduce Andre Spicconi, the CEO and president of Jewish Funders Network to frame the conversation and to introduce our speakers. Of today's thank you. Thank you, Tamar, and thank you all for being here. First of all, I hope that you and your loved ones are staying healthy and safe and um, making the most out of these challenging uh, times. Um, this presentation today, it's, it's, it's really important uh, on a number of dimensions. First of all, it's, it's an important initiative that's gonna help a lot of Jewish organizations and ultimately the Jewish community as a whole and at the same time is a realization of many principles of smart and strategic philanthropy. And those are principles that are very dear to, to Jeff N. And those of you who have been following Jeff N's over the year know that the, these, uh, the, the, the things that this coalition is trying to do, that this consortium is trying to do, respond to many of the key messages that, that we've been uh, promoting over time. One, the idea of partnership. You know, we always said philanthropy to be effective needs to include an element of partnership. And here we have partnership in two dimensions. A dimension of partnership between funders, sort of among the funders themselves, and a dimension of partnership between funders and communal organizations. So that bridging of, of these two worlds show that Private philanthropy and public philanthropy and communal philanthropy can work together for the for the for the for the improvement of the community, not only in crisis but in general. The second principle that this coalition illustrates is the notion of flexibility. We have here a group of funders who didn't stay in their lane when the crisis hit. They decided to be flexible and operate in different ways to respond to the crisis. And that's what philanthropy is all about. If philanthropy doesn't have the flexibility to react fast to changing circumstances, so who, who has that flexibility? Philanthropy is the most flexible sector that we have. So it's very reassuring and very comforting that funders are doing precisely that, are leaving their narrow lane and saying, how can we be more flexible and respond to the challenges? The third element is philanthropy is exercising leadership. You know, Lisa and Mark Turndorf and uh, Barry Feinstein and Felicia and all the members of the coalition, uh, Lisa's going to mention them all, they're stepping up. They're saying, you know, these are, you know, extraordinary times and we, we have to step up and, and do it. And they're doing it not in isolation, but with each other and with Jeff and I. Um, and, the, uh, and the last principle is something that I personally refer to a lot, which is, how to, how to work on this dimension of coordination and centralization. Sometimes it's not so easy to centralize stuff because people have different ideas, because the world is very diverse and very fragmented, but we can coordinate. And this is what this, what this fund also tries to do. So it is um, with great pleasure that I, that I open this conversation. Um, big, big pleasure by the by the leadership that funders are showing and by the and big hopes for what this can achieve in the Jewish community. Um, Lisa is going to talk about this, but the goal of this conversation is for the community, at the community of funders at large to know more about this and see how they can join. Uh, this is, uh, this was started by some of the major foundations, but uh, there is room for other funders to also join and participate in this effort. So without further ado, thanking you all again for joining. I'm going to give the floor to my dear friend, Lisa Eisen from the Schusterman Foundation. 
Thank you, Andres, and also to Tamar and Dina and JFN for, for hosting the call and giving us this the op opportunity to share some additional information with all of you. We really appreciate your interest and your participation and you know, your willingness to learn more. And as Andres said, we are eager to have more people join in this effort. So we, we hope that's, that some of you will consider doing that. Um, and I also just want to, at the outset, a special shout out to Shira and JFNA uh, and to Felicia and the roles that they're playing. They've been amazing partners in helping us um, move these initiatives forward. So I, I want to just uh, provide some high level thoughts on this, a bit of the backdrop and why we did it, and then um, just some key principles that are guiding us. And then I'm going to turn it over to Shira and Felicia to give uh, more detail, and then we'll open it to Q&A, as, uh, as, as Andres said. So um, in terms of the backdrop, when coronavirus started really becoming a serious concern, you know, probably later than it should have for, for many of us, but uh, let's say late February, early March, um, Several foundation leaders began speaking regularly about, you know, what could we do to really help the Jewish community face the crisis. Um, we had already helped initiate a letter to grantees that about 20 foundations signed on uh, to offer flexibility, as, as uh, Andres said, a key component of this moment and advancing payments and really being in partnership with our grantees about how they were going to weather this and what we could do to um, eliminate stresses on them and, and provide more flexibility. Um, but we also knew that was just not nearly gonna be enough. And we knew that the financial impact of COVID-19 was going to be very significant and we wanted to do something more significant to meet the moment. And we also knew that there was no way that our community could weather this crisis by doing business as usual. And rather, we would re require unprecedented collaboration among funders and, and also, as Andres said, between funders and the nonprofit community that makes the Jewish community run. And we would all have to be thinking of giving and acting in different ways and in more collaborative ways. And as we began surveying the needs of the various sectors of Jewish life, we understood it was going to take a major infusion of capital in order to help make sure that the, the key infrastructure of Jewish life that has sustained us all these decades was going to make it to the other side in some kind of health um, and in some kind of wholeness. And so we decided together to launch an interest-free loan fund as well as an aligned grant program. And to have these two efforts be complementary and aligned uh, efforts to help uh, aggregate funding and provide much needed resources to, to Jewish nonprofits. Uh, we set up what we are calling the Jewish Community Response and Impact Fund. And we have, I'm proud to say, already aggregated more than $90 million from eight foundations who are currently at the table. And uh, that includes Schusterman, Jim Joseph, Maimonides, Aviv, Wilf, Mandel, Singer, and Glazer. Some of you are on, on the phone and we are super grateful to all of the foundations that have already committed to providing uh, these generous resources. And we also know that it's not nearly enough. Um, and that's why we're so excited about this opportunity because we, we want to bring as many people as want to be part of the solution um, together. We asked Felicia uh, to lead the Align Grant Program. As I think you all know, she's a seasoned grant maker with great knowledge of the funding community and also incredible knowledge of our field and our sector. Um, and we also, as I said, partnered with JFNA to help uh, run the loan fund. And we're so fortunate that Shira Hutt, who's the chief of staff there and an experienced Jewish communal and foundation professional is, is driving uh, the sourcing of the loans and our relationships with Jewish networks and organizations. And uh, you'll hear from both of them in detail, but um, they're amazing partners. So I really am so grateful to both of you. Um, so a couple just high level points that I wanna share about how we're thinking about this. One is, like I said, we cannot do business as usual in this era. This is a consortium and a collaboration of foundations that have never worked together before. Um, you know, Jeff Solomon always says, if you know one foundation, you know one foundation. And 
These are all foundations that work very differently, that have different grantee areas, different approaches to grant making, different foci. But we all came together because we knew that we had to hold the higher interests of the Jewish community writ large uh, at heart. We couldn't only focus on our own grantees and our own way of doing business. We had to look at the broader community and think about what we could do together to get key institutions of Jewish life to the other side of this crisis. Um, and because of that, we're sort of all going outside of our own comfort zones. We're funding things that wouldn't normally fit in our parameters of funding. Um, and we're all, you know, giving up a little bit, but I think gaining something broader for the largest, larger Jewish community uh, on the other side of this. That's our hope. Um, secondly, um, we are hoping that we're going to use the loans which are interest-free loans that organizations will have four years to pay back to really bridge for organizations to get to the other side of this crisis, to give them some breathing room for camps who in all likelihood aren't gonna have a summer, their main source of income, for JCCs, day schools, Hillel's, BBYO's, organizations in the innovation sector, um, to give them three to six months of breathing room to be able to get to the other side, to do some planning, to figure out you know, how are they going to weather this storm? Um, and then we also thought it was really crucial together with that to have a, a grant program where those who didn't have a chance, for example, to, to actually repay loans, even over the course of a number of years, could get some emergency relief, but also to um, think about accelerating initiatives that are really promising and also to provide opportunity grants for opportunities that just you know, couldn't happen without this crisis and are crucial to meet the moment. And, and Felicia and Shira will talk about those. Um, we know this is not a panacea. It's important to say that. We've sort of decided we had to narrow even our focus, even with that much money, it's gonna go really fast. Um, so we have narrowed it to organizations that work on Jewish education, Jewish engagement and Jewish leadership. We're not focusing on social welfare organizations, which we felt the federations and local funders are much better suited to attack in their own communities and support in their own communities. Um, and even with that, we're not even close to meeting the need. We did, uh, JFNA did an initial assessment of the organization sort of in the sectors we're talking about. And the assessment was something like 600, $650 million in gap. So 90 million is a lot and it's not even gonna come close which is why we're really hoping to have more partners come on board with us. So, uh, you know, in the words of Pierre K. Avot, it's uh, not on us to complete the task, but we are not free to desist from it. Um, we, we look at this as being part of the solution, an arrow in the quiver of the philanthropic community. And um, we hope with more resources, we hope, you know, from some of you, uh, we can do a lot more to help, help all these organizations get through this. So I just want to invite you, if you're interested, to learn more, to join us. It's for foundations, funders of all different sizes, backgrounds, and focus areas. It's for loans and grants of all different sizes. Um, and beyond the dollars, we just want to send a message that we recognize what an unprecedented and stressful moment this is for the Jewish community and that we are all committed to joining together to make sure our Jewish community comes out stronger and healthier on the other side of this. So um, with that, I hope you'll consider investing together with us. And thank you again. I'm going to turn it over to Shira. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, it's nice to, nice to be with all of you today. Um, I want to start uh, with, with gratitude um, for the JFN team for, for making this uh, webinar come together. Uh, for all of you for being here to um, to learn from us and, and actually with us. One of the things we'll, we'll continue to talk about is that this has been really a learning process, certainly for, for me and for Felicia, but also I think for, for everyone who's been involved in this um, effort so far. Uh, and also really uh, so much gratitude, Lisa, to you for your partnership and, and by extension uh, to the partnership and investment, of course, of the other you plus the other um, seven uh, investors who've been with us on this journey so far. 
Um, and I should also say, although I'll say it at the end also when I hand it over to Felicia, just real gratitude for, um, for partnering with Felicia. Fun fact, Felicia and I worked together at a foundation uh, 15 plus years ago. So it's also been just uh, another silver lining um, uh, of, of this, uh, of the real, really the privilege of being part of this. Um, so as you heard, um, this is really a moment to, to work differently, to think differently and respond differently. And it's really in that spirit that, um, that we're approaching um, the interest-free uh, loan program as one of the two tracks within uh, JCRIF. Um, the, the loan program is um, intended to really provide a bridge, some breathing room um, for organizations during this really volatile moment. Um, and, uh, and so with that, we're really thinking about how we can help organizations primarily with the focus on short term, three to six month uh, sort of focused um, uh, loans in the half a million to $3 million range, but I'll talk about um, some modifications to that in a moment when I talk about our sourcing methods. Um, and, uh, and really, you know, I think another really important uh, thing to highlight about the loans and that work a little differently than, than the aligned grants is that the, the lenders that have come together to make the, the loan program possible are, 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 are working together to make collective decisions around how to deploy uh, those, those dollars, those, those loans. Um, you also may have seen, and I'll touch on this in terms of the, the process that has been underway, that another, um, another part of the, the loan partnership um, equation is uh, our partnership with the nonprofit finance fund, NFF, which is um, where the loan is housed and uh, is a core part of our process, uh, of the review process um, and the due diligence that will help guide the lenders in making decisions around how to deploy those dollars. Um, the sourcing uh, is really being approached um, through two key areas, and, and you'll start to hear some themes that will certainly come up uh, with the Align Grants program as well. Um, we're, looking, um, we're looking at um, uh, and working with uh, national networks, so really umbrella networks, and then we're also um, talking to um, uh, independent national organizations. Um, when I talk about um, the national networks, I include in that, by the way, the movements, uh, we're, we're treating them as national networks. Um, and the idea is that, first of all, we really wanna leverage the expertise of these national networks. And um, it's also allowing us to create some efficiencies uh, in how we, we, we really cast the widest net possible in responding to the need of the moment. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, uh, has been really just um, an incredible reminder in, in working on this right now is just how dynamic and how vast our Jewish uh, organizational ecosystem is. And I think, you know, Felicia and I spend hours upon hours having preliminary conversations with these networks and these um, independent organizations, yet alone sometimes, you know, subsequent follow-up discussions. And so um, we're really looking to these networks as a way to ensure that we're really thinking about this um, holistically in terms of um, reaching the entire U.S. The, it's, it's a U.S. specific program. Um, and, and so we're really um, depending on um, the networks as essentially, in many ways, our sourcing partner. Um, the idea in working with the networks also is that um, they, uh, they, in the sourcing process, um, are invited to consider applying for loans um, that could then be deployed within their networks. So they would be borrowers for the purpose of then um, giving out grants or um, sub loans, if you will. Um, or in, and in many cases, this is um, the path that they're taking, or they're working with us to essentially source the applications um, and then ultimately to bring forward um, a number of applications from their network. So um, that includes um, Hillel International on behalf of local Hillels, Prisma on behalf of day schools, JCCA on behalf of JCCs. As I mentioned, the movements are uh, sourcing and thinking about um, how um, synagogues 
in other part, you know, FJC, of course, um, in terms of the camping world and on and on. It's also, uh, we've, we've, although we've been, we started with the big networks, there's actually other, um, many other networks that exist in our uh, ecosystem. And so um, we are hearing from them also and connecting with them um, all the time. Um, I should also mention, I, and I, um, we talk about these programs a lot, so forgive me if Lisa did say this in the introduction, and you may have read this, but the JCRIF is focused on advancing the area of education, engagement, uh, and leadership. And so um, while there's certainly a ton that fits in there, that does create some, some parameters in terms of, of the scoping um, uh, and the sourcing process. Um, you know, and uh, the last thing I'll, so two other things that I'll share, I mentioned the the half a million to three million range, which is what we're typically looking at. Uh, although there is, of course, a, um, a detailed calculation that every organization, every applicant um, uh, needs to work through as part of the application process to help um, for, for, first for, for their own process and then, and then for the lenders and for NFF to determine what the appropriate uh, loan amount would be. For organizations that are um, being sourced through national networks. The lenders um, are uh, allowing applications at the uh, level of 150,000 or up. Special guest behind me. Um, and, uh, and so that, that also is a recognition that for some organizations, you know, not, some of the organizations, many of the organizations that have needs in the moment are not big and don't necessarily need a big loan. Um, and so uh, we've been hearing that organizations, of course, appreciate that. Um, and um, the last thing I'll just say is that, you know, we launched this three weeks ago. I my sense is that we're probably days away from beginning to receive applications. So it's still early day in this process. Um, and uh, and the, that will then allow us, and by us, I mean the, the, the lenders to really begin the review process, which will include both their own review of applications as well as the due diligence of NFF. Um, so I will, I could actually talk, um, I can go on and on and on, but I will stop so that my uh, wonderful partner and uh, JCRIF can, um, can take it from here, tell you a little bit more about the Aligned Grants Program. And then as Lisa said, uh, you know, I know both of us are, are eager to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, Shira. Um, <clears throat> So I'll start just by repeating a couple of things. One is gratitude to JFN and gratitude to all of the partners in this incredible endeavor. We are working very hard in ways that we've never worked together before. And it's really been a huge learning experience and a huge pleasure and a huge privilege um, to work with all of the partners. It's also been an incredible privilege to work with the applicants for the loans and the grants, because I just have to tell you, as I'm sure you all know from your own work, there is so much pain out in the Jewish communal world these days, as of course there is more broadly. And Shira and I have been on calls. We've been trying to do initial calls together, you know, with different networks and organizations. And we just have really, I feel like the incredible privilege of hearing the struggles that people are working through and um, how much they're mourning the loss of things. And then also really how creatively they are thinking through how to, how to adapt to the current moment. So realizing that they can't save everything, even if we had three or four or five times the amount of money in this fund alone, we couldn't, we couldn't save everything and really trying to think strategically about how we get to the other side of this crisis um, as thoughtfully and strategically as possible. And really even I think, you know, with, with some um, improvements, if we can say that, um, to the way the system worked before. So um, I, I wanna tell you about the Aligned Grants Fund. Um, I wanna tell you about the, the animating questions that we are thinking about as we talk to organizations. Um, and the different buckets of funding that we are offering. Um, and I will just echo Lisa's, um, you know, her beautiful invitation for people to join us. I'm actually in the midst just today of re reviewing initial emergency grant requests. And there's far more than, than any of us could do on our own, far more than we could do together. Everything is so important. Um, and the more we have 
uh, the more money we have in this fund or the more there is just you know a willingness of funders to step up and do even more in a terrible time the more we'll be able to help communal organizations new and old um, so the animating questions behind the fund behind the grant fund um, are about first is about the, the functions that we need thriving Jewish communities to have on the other side of this. So in a way, this is, we're asking organizations, the kind of conversation that we're having with organizations helps them to sort of take themselves out of their usual way of thinking of just, how do I preserve my institution? How do I preserve things exactly the way they are now? But really to think like, wow, we're really in a moment of, of crisis and transition, so I need to think differently about things. So asking people, asking organizations to think about the functions that they serve is a way of sort of stripping away some of the, the programmatic ways that those functions have been delivered in the past and really to think about, okay, it's you know 2020, we're, in, we're under current constraints, the constraints might stay in different ways over time. How do we continue to perform the function that we want to perform, even if it might look differently? And another way to think about that is to think about assets. What are the assets that our institutions have? Um, those could be hard assets, they could be real estate, they could be buildings, um, and they could be soft assets, they could be people. You know, do we have incredible leaders that we need to make sure you know, continue with us or with other organizations in some form um, over time? Do we have audiences that we're touching that we can't lose in this moment? And how do we think about preserving those, those audiences and those people? And also ideas. Um, this is where, you know, in, in all of my years on, we've been focused on funding uh, startups and emerging organizations. And we know that not every small organization can survive a crisis like this. They couldn't actually all survive to begin with, but they have many of them amazing ideas. So how do we make sure that those ideas get preserved and integrated maybe into larger and stronger organizations so that we're continuing to innovate and adapt the community over time? So we've been um, we've put the grants into three loose buckets that sort of run into each other a little bit, so don't take these as hard and fast rules, but three buckets of funding. So the first is about emergency grants, um, and we've been talking to organizations about, um, you know, what are, the, what are the irreversible choices you're about to make um, that hopefully we can help forestall um, with some money. What are, in, what are parts of your networks that are either too important to fail or too big to fail or too important to fail. And those are two really different things. You know, in some, if you talk to the camps or even to the day schools or even to the to Chabad, you know, there are some places where there's only one Jewish institution in that community or even in that region. And if there's a small camp that is the only game in town, you know, we that's the, the camping system continue considers that camp to be too important to fail. So we're trying to look at things on a lot of different vectors um, for the emergency grants. And we're also realizing even for the emergency grants that some emergencies are happening right now and some are gonna happen down the road. So this is like a, it's not like a disaster with a hurricane, you know, where it all happens at once. This is rolling and the emergency needs even will, will more and more will emerge over time. The second bucket of grants um, is about uh, opportunity investments. So there are some things that are working really well right now. This has been, of course, like the most exciting part of these conversations. There are some that organizations across the board have done an incredible job of adapting to the current constraints and of already thinking about the ways that the success of those adaptations leads them to think about changing their work permanently or at least, you know, into the future. Um, and there are some organizations that were built for this moment. Um, I think just for example, you know, if you think about all of the people who are showing up to certain kinds of uh, certain synagogues, you know, on Shabbat, because those services are amazing, or showing up to particular adult education classes, because now you can take an adult education class with any teacher in the world, basically, from the comfort of your living room. Those are really interesting adaptations to the way that we're used to getting services small s um, from Jewish communities and being able to enable organizations, you know, give them some oxygen to really develop those things that are working is also really important in this moment. And the third area um, is about strategic change or systemic change, really helping organizations and networks and sectors to think about 
how this moment um, reveals maybe things that they already knew were not working very well in their sectors, um, things that they can start to think through um, changing for the future, whether that's about maybe rethinking financial models, membership models, um, thinking through collaborations. This has been, I have to say, actually one of the most inspiring pieces of, um, of our conversations is the willingness of organizations to think about new forms of collaboration and partnership, whether that's within their own systems, you know, where even in their own system things are siloed, institutions are siloed, or thinking from system to system, from sector to sector. We know that the heads of all of the major networks that we're talking to, the JCCs, the camps, the day schools, that they are constantly talking to each other, that they understand the ways that their systems intersect. And I would say um, that, uh, you know, even between the, I guess what we would call sort of the legacy sort of big brand name kinds of institutions and the smaller institutions, there is so much interest in working together from both sides. So I think what we'll see out of this, um, and hopefully we'll be able to start some of these balls rolling with these systemic change grants, we'll see a lot more collaboration. That's also consolidation, but collaboration, hopefully where one plus one, you know, equals three or or maybe even more than that. Um, I'll just, I'll end where I started and then we're happy to answer questions about this and just say that it really is an incredible privilege to listen to the challenges and the ideas that organizations are facing right now. Um, the aligned grant fund is set up a little bit differently than the loan fund and the loan fund, the funders are all making their decisions together. In the grant fund, we call an aligned fund because each of the funders will make their decisions on their own. So we're sourcing applications, putting them through a sort of simple, um, short application process, and then giving them to all the funders to make decisions. And I think what that will enable is, on the one hand, a lot of collaboration among the funders, um, but also some, you know, it, it preserves a sense of, of independence for the funders about making decisions um, that are, mo are most appropriate for their own foundations. Um, I think, you know, Lisa said in the beginning that the funders all come together out of an understanding that this is not business as usual and that those of us who are blessed to have the resources to give away need to be thinking even more broadly beyond what we usually fund into other kinds of sectors and really thinking about Jewish communities as a whole. Um, I think that the grant fund is really set up to do that, to allow us to think differently um, and then also to to make our own decisions as funders. Um, that's what I got. Um, and I think we're we're happy to take questions. Tamar, do you wanna yes. are you gonna Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you to all of all of our presenters for sharing, sharing all of that information. I know there's a lot, there's a lot to digest and a lot to think about. And thank you for all the work that you're doing with that. So I wanna open, I wanna open the line. To, for all of you that are participating to either write in the chat box or just raise your hand and, uh, and unmute yourself and please ask, ask um, Lisa, Felicia and Shira your questions or even each other, like fellow participants questions about how we might be able to collaborate and engage um, with this fund in the best way. Great, I see we have some, a question that came in. So one of them is, um, what is the timeline for both the loan and the grants? And I leave that to Felicia, Lisa, or Shira, whoever would like to start that off about the timeline. Go ahead, Felicia. Um, it's just, it's rolling in both cases. Um, and uh, we're prior, on the grant side, we're prioritizing emergency requests right now. Um, but on both sides, it's it's rolling. So as Shira said, the loan applications are starting to come in, the grant requests are starting to come in, um, and both funds are technically open until the end of the year for requests. Um, and we'll have to see how that plays out in terms of the size of the request, what we're able to do, and hopefully new infusions of capital so that we can keep going to meet as much of the need as possible. Okay, thank you. Um, Another question that just came in is, what was the rationale to not do an open RFP and instead invite people to apply? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll step into that for a minute and then maybe Felicia and Shira can add. Um, look, we, 
as I said, we, we knew we only had enough resources to meet a certain part of the need. And mm -hmm. we also know that organizations are really, really in crisis. Um, so we didn't want to waste the time of grantees filling out applications um, that, you know, either didn't have a chance or being funded or what So we were trying to find a way to really focus. Um, and that is why we decided to go through the networks. We thought we could reach as many institutions as possible by having, you know, sort of the, the platform organization that coordinates that field work with that field and, and bring forward requests. Um, and, you know, it was about efficiency and, 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 an ability to really, as it is, Felicia and Shira are working around the clock on phone calls and Zoom calls constantly. And um, so I think if we would have just opened it up to the entire world, it would have wasted a lot of people's time. And we're hoping this way we can get the most promising uh, proposals uh, funded mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. And I would, I would just add two things. One is that we're reaching out to a real diverse uh, cross section of the community. So it's not like, oh, they're just, you know, I think one of the questions is, are you just funding, you know, the boring old infrastructure? It's completely not the case. We're, we're reaching out to lots of different kinds of organizations and networks. And the other thing is that I would say is I have at Natan, we almost always have an open call for proposals. And I can't, and that is really necessary, you know, in that the form follows function, right? In a ton of we're trying to fund innovation, we need to have an open call for proposals because we need to be able to hear about things that we've never heard of. Here, what we're trying to do is we, between all of us together, the funders and the federation system, I feel like we have a pretty good sense of what is already out there and that we can then direct, you know, the applications and save the time of applicants um, requesting funds if we're, not able to make it um, to make all of those grants. I always say, like, I can't imagine how many hours I have spent, Natan members have spent, and applicants have spent in applying to Natan for grants that they couldn't get, and we just mm -hmm. could not waste anybody's time in this time of crisis. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add. Oh, I'm sorry, Tamara. I, no, I just, please. I just wanted to add um, uh, in terms of the loans. You know, what's interesting is that um, we're doing this sort of on the heels of the SBA, um, the PPP loan process. And so um, two things on that. First of all, and by the way, on that note, um, people who apply, organizations that applied and received PPP loans are still eligible. It's, you know, this is the time frame, as Felicia said, we're looking at, we're looking out and through this calendar year. Um, so two things, first of all, it shouldn't surprise anyone that the day this was announced, like, you know, I, we were hearing from organizations that were frantic, right? Because the, the SBA loan process was frantic. So everyone mm. thought like, we have to get our applications in. So this is also allowing us to just, um, you know, breathe, allow, help the organizations breathe and really do this with intention and clarity. And unlike the SBA loans, um, these are not forgivable loans. Um, the intent that it's incredible terms for a loan, it's zero interest the, um, organizations will have up to 48 months to repay those loans. Um, and so we want to make sure that especially organizations that are not used to taking out loans or don't have experience um, and, and certainly uh, on, or only have the experience of the SBA loan process are just understand what it means to, to do this, how it can help them. And um, also as you're hearing, I hope you're hearing, you know, um, uh, Felicia and I really are working together, even though these are two different programs. Um, organizations are also not, you know, this is not, uh, we don't get on calls together and, and ask organizations to choose one or the other. They're different tracks. And in many cases, networks and organizations are considering how they might access resources through both programs. And so again, it's allowing us and the organizations to be more strategic, thoughtful, and deliberate about how to approach um, you know, this, this opportunity and we, and, and, and I should also say in the same breath, because there's a lot of truths in the moment that we also are trying to move this forward quickly because of course, everyone, especially the, the funders want to get resources into the hands of the organizations that need it so, so desperately right now. Very good. I appreciate that. It really is wonderful that you're thinking about everybody's experience in, in trying to apply for these loans and making sure that it's could be best for the community when and respecting that people are so stretched right now and wanting to do so much good in the community, trying to streamline that is, is a really wonderful way to, to think about this. Um, another question is about how the decision-making mechanism has been set up for the loans 
and how the different decisions are being made. And I want to, it's pretty open up, like what are the criteria? How do you see that going? I know it's a rolling process, but if you can make a few comments on that. Sure, sure, I'll be happy to. So, um, so there's, um, there's two steps to the actual, I mean, in many ways, the sourcing is part, I mean, that's very much part of the process, the conversations and interactions with networks and with organizations. The, the actual review process will take place in two stages. Um, uh, applicants, um, I'm working with applicants to gather, um, gather a num uh, some initial information uh, that, in, that incorporates both financial detail as well as organizational um, information, uh, you know, general information, certainly um, information that uh, help, will help the lenders and then subsequently NFF um, understand what other, you know, the full picture. Um, what, what is, what's happening right now um, with the organization and how are they responding to the moment, both financially and um, in terms of their, the work and some of some of what you heard from Felicia as well, you know, where are the pivots? What are they doing to continue to meet the needs of their, uh, you know, continue to serve their their constituencies? Um, uh, and uh, and the review process will um, begin with the lenders reviewing applications, um, and then um, once there's a preliminary assessment on those um, applications, uh, they will they will then be invited to complete the second. Part of the process, which will happen through um, through the nonprofit finance fund. What I want to say about that is that there is, um, you know, there's a cost both in time and money of having NFF um, provide um, go through their process, provide th that due diligence, and so we want to be mindful of how we use the organization's time, NFF's time, and the lender's time in going through that second stage of the process, uh, but then ultimately those recommendations will be brought back to the lenders who will be um, making those uh, decisions. Thank you. Now a little bit of a different type of topic about how to join as a, as a funder. So how would one go about joining the loan pool and what is the different points of entry that's, if there's a funder on the call here, what are the different points that they can learn about? To, to be involved and collaborate with you. You want to take the, the grant part, Felicia, or you want me to? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, the way the grant fund is set up right now, we have three levels. They're very broad levels um, on the grant fund. Um, the first is the anchor grant funders are giving, uh, are committing, remember it's not a pooled fund, so they're committing to give $5 million to applications that come through this program. Um, and uh, the anchor funders are also taking a first pass at all the applications and sort of putting together the grant slates. Um, the next uh, layer out is funders giving a million to $5 million. And those are funders who are also deciding, they're looking at the grant slates that the anchor funders put together and deciding which of the uh, grants they want to participate in. Um, and still the same, going back to their boards and getting approval, you know, on on uh, on which grants that they want to be part of. Um, and then there's a level below a million dollars, um, and we are setting up a fund at um, at JFNA to enable anyone giving less than a million dollars um, to give to that fund, which will then be allocated at the discretion of the funders. Um, uh, you know, according basically to, to the need that comes in through the applications. Great. Thank you. Lisa, did you want to sorry, say anything? Sorry, did you want to mention sorry. no, that's the, the second part. It's for the loan, right? Not for the grants. No, that was just for the grants. So, oh, Lisa okay. or Kira, do you want to talk about the loans? Okay. I just want to know if you wanted to mention that there's going to be a, a, a portal set up at both uh, JFN um, on the JFN site and also at the JFNA Jewish Together site where if you want to contribute to, um, to the funds that you can, you can contribute and we will you know, make sure you get all the information you need and, um, and, you, and you can be part of it. You can also follow up with me or Felicia or Shira if you have more questions about you know, how to do it and levels and all of that. We, Welcome the conversations. 
And sure, if you want to add anything on the loans. Sure, sure. Um, I'll just say that, um, of course, you know, what you're hearing in terms of um, the moment and the fact that we want to bring more resources together certainly is true for the loans as well. It's a little different because you can't make you can't make those payments through a portal for the for loans just work differently. Um, so um, I would certainly welcome the opportunity to continue the conversation with you as would Lisa, you know, you can certainly talk to Felicia or others of the of, that are currently funding this and we can talk to you about what it means to actually get set up as um, to, to be a funder of the loans. Um, the anchor lenders, the, the first group of lenders that have come together have um, each brought with them $10 million in committed um, funds towards this loan program and it's loans, right? So the money is gonna be paid back. Um, uh, and of course the group is, um, as I mentioned, coming together to make collaborative decisions. And that also means that they're taking on risks together. Um, so there's many details um, that we, I can you know, walk you through and, and, and others from, from the lender group that I know would be thrilled to have that conversation with you. But, but it is possible to, to join in the lender group without giving it, it numbers yes. under $10 million. Yes, exactly. Thank make you. that clear. Thank you. So how does think, just can you can you can you go uh, can you give more details on that? So somebody says, I want to put one million dollar into the pool. How does that work? Uh, what rights and responsibilities do I have? That is a great question, and I'm going to put that in the category of um, we're learning as we're going along. So we will get some clarity on that uh, in terms of how. The lenders are making decisions and where um, you know where gifts as Felicia said you know that the line grants has thought through the different uh, giving amounts and what that means in terms of how the funds come together and are used and we'll do the same on loan so thank you for the question Great. thank you there's another question that just came in and I believe you touched on it a bit with the portal that you discussed but Somebody um, wrote me that wants to share what they learned with the CEO and believes that many, there may be a few foundations in his area that would be interested in being part of this noble effort. If she agrees after they share more of this information, how do we share what the fund is doing with those family foundations? Is that information gonna be easily, easily accessible on the portal that you discussed or is there another place that, that we can direct them to today? Well, at, at the moment, we can certainly share information about how everything is set up. Um, and we're still working on, we still haven't, you know, making any decisions yet. So if, if the question is just, is there information that you can share, you know, now, absolutely, we have documents and we can send those out. Um, in terms of what we wind up funding, if that's the question, um, there just isn't a list yet. Um, and, um, and obviously, that list will be changing over time. So. But we are very happy to talk to anyone who's interested in this and even to say, you know, that there will be um, national, one of the things for sure that will happen is that there'll be national strategies that are emerging, you know, from some of the, from now, some of the national networks that can't be implemented, that they, you know, a single, whatever, that, that can then be implemented locally if we have funders who are dedicated to working in those local areas. So it's also possible you could say, well, I care about my region, so I'm going to join the fund, commit or join the grant program, commit to giving, you know, whatever it is um, to my local region, and then just wait until the ideas come from the different sectors that you can then deploy locally. Great. So so just piggybacking on what you just mentioned, so if there are applications that you're getting in that you're unable to fund, is that going to become public so other, other people can jump on and try to fund those specific projects? Just to clarify a little bit of what you were just talking about. So we haven't uh, made that decision yet, um, only okay. because we haven't seen any applications yet. A right. lot of this is like, how do we set it up in the abstract versus what does it look like in practice? In practice, mm -hmm. there is so much need out there. And I think, you know, if there are ways that we can find to, um, to share what, what organizations are sharing with us with a broader public at some point, I mean, I think we're, we'll need to be able to do that because the needs are vast. I do keep saying to the applicants, um, to the organizations that are applying, that even just the exercise of writing up a proposal for us will hopefully be helpful to them, even if we can't support it. Um, and they really are, I have to say, rising to the occasion in ways that are 
incredible given how many other things they're doing and how pressing all of the needs are. And I would say that, you know, um, you know, those ideas and those proposals sort of belong to them at the end of the day. And the more that they can shop them around and try to get funding um, for the needs that they've now articulated and the opportunities that they're now foreseeing, you know, the better, the better we'll be. Great. Thank you. We have a few more minutes together, so I want to continue to encourage people if you have another question. Um, I see that all of our presenters are really open to even the tougher questions as this as they're developing this, this program and have been so appreciate your transparency and your openness with all of this. So don't be afraid to ask some other questions if you have them in our last few minutes. Another question that we did um, just get is about what is your estimation in terms of loan defaults? You spoke about that it's a loan, a really generous loan, but what are your thoughts about that in, in terms of- to take that, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Be great. Yeah. Um, well, look, our our hope is that generally there'll be a recovery and people will be able to repay over the coast of four years. I mean, we've given them a good amount of time and we want these organizations to emerge healthy. So we're hoping they're going to be in a position to repay. And all of us know that we're taking on some risk. You know, um, yeah, that's what happens when you make loans. And um, mm -hmm. So we're going to, with the help of, of nonprofit finance fund, we're going to assess the risk of, of each individual application. Um, but I know that the funders who are in the, the lenders are willing to take on some risk and there may be some, there may be some default or who knows, you know, uh, we're, we're going in with the assumption that they can repay, but there, you know, there may be at the end some decisions on loan forgiveness because there just may be organizations who just can't do it. Um, so I hope that answers, mm -hmm. answers the question. Yeah. Can I also just make a meta point about that? Two meta points. One is that I think this is a fascinating um, experiment in different ways of giving. I and mean, we've never, as far as I know, never had a collective or collaborative loan fund in the Jewish community to do something like this. So I could be wrong, but um, we are all learning. Shira is becoming the world's expert on nonprofit loans. Who knew? Um, and it's amazing. You know, we're, we are learning and the organizations are learning. I think there are organizations, you know, that instinctively when they get on the phone for the first time with me and Shira, they think, okay, we'll have to listen to the loan part and then we'll get to the fun grant part. And they're really understanding that loans are a really important tool in, a, in the toolbox, you know, in the financial toolbox of an organization, especially with a loan program that's set up this generously. And I think it's been a really good learning experience for the organizations as well. Yeah, and, and I, and if I may, I mean, just like the, the way I started this is by saying, this crisis is a lot of bad things, but it's also an accelerator for good things, right? And and this is probably a way in which we should look at grant making um, in normal times as well. Try to be strategically aligned and try to pull resources when it makes sense and be aligned when it doesn't make sense to pull them. So I think that this could be just not not something that is done to respond to the crisis, but something that we learn and we hopefully incorporate as a, as a grant making practice uh, going forward. Amar, do we have yeah. any more questions? We do, and they're, they're big ones, so we can just yeah. um, touch on them for a moment. So one is, do you have a sense of the size of the grant the group would consider, and what happens if the proposal gets funding but not enough to execute the project? Great question. Um, my other meta point was basically that we're flying the plane as we're building it and evolving the answers to all these questions. And I think that that's another good philanthropic lesson, Andres, you can write about it, um, about um, responding quickly and just doing your best in a time of immense need. So I think we'll, we'll have to see. We, we're not putting right now a limit on the amount of the grant request, but already I can tell you that the, the, the requests are enormous. Um, and I think we'll just have to see what we're able to do and then what we can do in partnership with organizations to try to help them, you know, to meet the need in other ways. Thank you. Um, one last question and I, that I've gotten in here and I wonder how you can comment on this and, and that we understand is still very much evolving, but so I guess Felicia, maybe without naming a specific organization, can you give some specific examples of programs that you believe would be attractive to the grant fund? 
or some ideas that have started have started coming in that seem really exciting? I mean, I, you know, in the initial round of emergency grants, um, we're really reaching out to all of all of the sectors, the major sectors that you can think of of Jewish communal life, and this is true in the grants as well. Um, each of the different pools of funding or pools of funding, each of the different buckets of applications, you know, has a really will have a really different flavor to them. So, I think in the emergency grants, we're we're really looking at all different, you know, kinds of of functions played in Jewish communities from synagogues, camps, JCCs, everything, schools, um, innovative organizations, cultural organizations. Um, and I think over time, I, you know, I mean, I, there definitely will be, there definitely are trends that are emerging even quickly. I mean, trends around collaboration, trends around intergenerational work, of course, trends around the use of technology and how you, um, you know, how you can create uh, we assume in the future hybrid programs that, that more in, incorporate technology in really you know high high quality ways with in person programming. Um, so we will we'll have to see. I, this first round is about emergencies and and it's not exciting. It's very sad. You know, um, it's it's again an incredible privilege to be able to help in a time like this. But there is again just immense pain. Um, in every sector and as long, you know, until people know sort of when this is over and when we can get to the point where we feel like we're rebuilding as opposed to just in the moment crisis, it's really hard, hard to know what the overall landscape is going to look like. Right. And on that, I also want to say that I, I know I feel all of your, I don't know if it's pain, but all of the work that you're putting into it, knowing that I'm getting emails from, from you guys in the middle of the night because you're thinking through this so thoughtfully and and you know, taking in all the information that you're getting. So, so I see it and we feel it and the community does really appreciate it. Um, Lisa, I wanted to ask you if you had some more, some yeah, more to Yeah, I just share. wanted one more Thank thought you. before we close. And um, yeah, Felicia and Shira especially are, are working, as I said, around the clock and we're so grateful. We just all you know, desperately want to get money out into the field. So we've all been taking on another full-time job um, to do this and, um, you know, we really hope that that some of you will consider joining. In terms of the grants, I did want to say that um, without giving any specifics, we, we are going to try to get emergency grants out the door as soon as possible, but we are also getting a lot of really creative and um, great ideas to meet this moment, this particular moment, and we, we want to make sure that we're funding, um, you know, some of that innovation, creativity, and and the demand that we're seeing out there for certain kinds of programs that is higher than it's ever been. So um, I wanted to say that. And the other thing I want to say before we close is if any of the, the funders on the call have interest in talking more and learning more, um, please be in touch with me. Uh, just shoot me an email and I'm happy to follow up and get you more information. Um, I want to keep Felicia and Shira focused on, you know, working with the organizations and getting all the great proposals uh, our way. And I'm happy to, you know, be the point person if you want to talk further about how you can participate. Um, and reiterating Felicia's point, we're, we're building the plane while we're flying it. We don't have every single thing figured out, but with every question that we get from you and others, we can get, you know, closer to providing good answers. And those people who come in now can, can help us figure it out. So we're super grateful that all of you you know, stay with us on this call, join the call, and we hope to have a chance to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you, Tamara, for, as always, uh, running the webinar so smoothly. This is number, what, 10 of the week already? Uh, it feels <laughs> so, like it, yes. <laughs> so um, I um, just to thank you to the panelists, and thank you for all of you, of you for your leadership and for being such a great example of, of strategic and thoughtful philanthropy and collaborative philanthropy. Uh, it's, it's really the things that the community need now. Uh, nobody, just relax, nobody hopes, nobody expects that you have all the I's dotted and all the T's crossed. This is, we're all working as we, uh, you know, we're all walking together and running and trying what we do and try to do what we can in the crisis. Uh, just the last word to offer any assistance that uh, Jeff and 
can provide in this process to uh, our members and to the and to the and to the coalition we're happy to 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 help and to and to connect more funders more of our members to this to this great initiative you can talk to the to the to lisa felicia shira but also you can talk to to me and to dina uh, fuchs at at jfn will be more than happy to <clears throat> to uh, assist you as you as you try to join this this effort so thank you all thank very you. much stay thank safe you, stay healthy and um keep do keep doing your amazing work <laughs>